Hi guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime video. I want to say before we get started, the hair, I'm not really feeling it today. I didn't know what to do with it. This happened. I hairsprayed it. I don't know how to get it out now, so we're just keeping it. Before we get started with today's video, I want to thank our two sponsors, which are Sunsoil CBD as well as NordVPN. If you guys have been following me for a while, you know that I am always up for trying new CBD brands and seeing which ones out there work best for me and I love sharing those experiences and my findings with you guys so I want to talk with you today about Sun Soil CBD. Sun Soil CBD makes oil that is USDA certified organic. CBD is made from hemp plants so how the hemp is grown is actually very very crucial. With Sun Soil they farm their hemp in Vermont and they never use any pesticides, herbicides, or any GMOs. I know me personally I've been really trying to be more mindful about what I'm putting into my body, which is why I love Sun Soil because it's made from simple ingredients. My personal favorites from them are the soft gels as well as their CBD coconut oil. Many of their products actually just contain coconut oil and hemp. That's literally it. Sun Soil clearly labels the amount of CBD that's in each serving and tests out every batch of product at three independent labels and publishes the results on their website. Sun Soil makes CBD oil with simple organic ingredients and if you guys want to try it out you can get 30% off your first order by going to sunsoil.com slash killer that's sunsoil.com slash killer for 30% off your first order and I'll have that link for you guys in the description box below and now let's talk about Nord VPN now if you don't know what a VPN is a VPN stands for a virtual private network now what does a VPN do well, essentially, a VPN helps secure your own online privacy and security. A VPN is the perfect option for people who want an extra layer of protection when they are browsing the web online. It's also great if you want to get access to blocked websites. For example, if you wanted to access YouTube in a place where it wasn't available, a VPN is perfect for that as well. Also, if you are someone who uses public Wi-Fi a lot, whether that be at a coffee shop, an airport, hotel, anything like that, you'll really want a VPN because it makes it way more difficult for hackers to get a hold of your information. Personally, I'm someone who definitely needs to know that my information is being kept secure when I'm on a public Wi-Fi, which is why NordVPN has been an absolute must for me. I personally have been hacked before, and if you have also been in that same boat, you know how crucial it is to use a system that you trust to protect you. Now, if you guys want to try out NordVPN for yourself and get started on protecting your internet safety, you you can get 68% off a two-year plan plus one additional month for free by going to nordvpn.com slash killer instinct and using the code killer instinct. Again, you will get 68% off a two-year plan plus one additional month for free when you use that code. So I will also have that linked in the description box below for you to check out as well. So thank you to our two sponsors for today. And with that being said, let's move on to the rest of the case. So as you guys can tell by the title of today's video, today we are talking about the unsolved disappearance of 19 year old Brianne Wolgram. This is one of those cases that is extremely frustrating and by the time we get to the end of it you will probably be sitting there and thinking are you kidding that's literally all we have to go off of. It's one of those cases where you're going to want so much more information than you're given in this case. That's why it's been unsolved for all of these years and that's why I still think it's very crucial to talk about it and to hear your guys's opinion Honest, because I do think that there are a lot of different theories in this case, which typically happens in cases that don't have a lot of information. It leaves a lot of room for the imagination to want to test out different theories. Brianne Wolgram went missing on September 5th, 1998 from Revelstoke, British Columbia. And this is Brianne. She was born on March 25th, 1979. She has light brown curly hair that stopped at about her shoulders. She has blue eyes and she also has a birthmark on the back of her right leg. Brienne was last seen wearing blue jeans, a white t-shirt, and black sandals. Brienne is described as a very soft-spoken young woman. She was kind to everyone that she came across. And she's also described as someone who's an extremely hard worker. She was dedicated to anything she set her mind to. At the time of her disappearance, she had two different jobs. She was working part-time at a local McDonald's, as well as a full-time job at a gas station called Old Frontiers Super Save, which was located 
located along Trans Canada Highway in Revelstoke. Now, Revelstoke is described as a picture perfect town surrounded by nature. As you can tell, it's extremely beautiful. It's surrounded by mountains and just beauty everywhere you look. It was actually featured on National Geographic's Ultimate Adventure Bucket List. And while I was not able to find the population in Revelstoke at 1998, the year Brienne went missing, I was able to find it in 2016. That was the only place I could find any sort of population in that area. And the population of Revelstoke in 2016 was about 7,500 people. Growing up, Brienne lived with her two parents, Cheryl and Cliff, as well as her two older brothers named Troy and Todd, who had both moved out of the house at the time of Brienne's disappearance. So at the time of Brienne's disappearance in her house, it was just her as well as her parents. Her two brothers had gone off at this point. Now, all in all, Brienne was described as your typical teenager. She liked to hang out with her friends. She liked to go to parties sometimes. And while she did dabble in a little bit of drinking, she never got into any drugs or anything of that sort. Brienne had big dreams of going to college and getting married and having a family of her own. And at the time of her disappearance, Brienne didn't have a particular boyfriend. She did have some people that she had her eye on. She had some crushes, but at that time she wasn't dating anyone in particular. So let's talk about Friday, September 4th, 1998, which is the day prior to Brienne's disappearance. Now on this day, Brienne had worked the late shift at the McDonald's that she worked at. And after she got off of work, she went out and hung out with some of her friends. We really don't know what exactly happened that night, but what we do know is that the following day on the 5th, when Brienne went to her shift at the gas station, she seemed a little bit off. Her coworker said that she was a lot quieter than usual. It seemed like something was bothering her. And at one point she even broke down and started crying in the middle of her shift. Now it was never made clear what exactly Brienne was so upset over. No one really knew. Brienne didn't tell anyone or disclose that information to anyone. However, according to Brienne's mom, Cheryl, she said, quote, she had a quick cry about it and then she got over it end quote. But even with that statement, no one knows why she was upset that day. Now, Brienne got off of work around seven and she decided that she was going to go home and take a nap. And remember, this was on the 5th of September. Now her family, her parents were going to a barbecue, but Brienne decided against the barbecue. She didn't want to go. Mind you, it was Labor Day weekend. So there were people going out and doing things, barbecues, parties, things like that. And Brienne had her own plans for that night. Brienne's plans were that she was going to go home, take a nap, kind of revamp herself, and she had plans to go out this night with her best friend, Christy Kane. Now, Christy also worked at this gas station, and she told Brienne to pick her up when her shift ended at 11.15 p.m. from the gas station, and Christy also told Brienne that she should go pick up some wine coolers before she came and picked up Christy. That way, they would have something to drink that night when they went out to their party. So Brienne was going to go get drinks, go get Christy, and go out to the parties together. That was the initial plan, but that is not what ended up happening. Brienne never made it to the gas station to pick up Christy that night. And after waiting around a little bit, Christy decided the best thing to do would be to call Brienne's house phone to see if she was there, to see if her parents knew where she was. And Brienne's parents said that she was not home and they were under the impression that Brienne was going to pick Christy up. So this is when the panic started to set in. Now it was the following day when a missing persons report was filed. And once this happened, there were actually four witnesses who came forward to authorities to tell them that they saw Brienne the night of September 5th. According to four different witnesses, Brienne was seen at the local 7-Eleven on September 5th between the times of 11 o'clock p.m. and 11.30 p.m. All of these witnesses, these four witnesses said that they knew Brienne personally, which is why they were for certain that it was Brienne that they saw that night. And all four of these witnesses also said that Brienne was not alone when she was at the 7-Eleven. According to the witnesses, they said that Brienne was seen talking to three different young women outside of the 7-Eleven. Now, no one was able to identify who these three women were, and to this day, 
those three women have never come forward. Now, because of the witness statements, composite sketches were able to be made of these three young women, and this is what they looked like. One of the women was described as being five foot four and having a little bit of a heavier build. She had shoulder length brown hair and was wearing jeans, a white t-shirt, and sandals. The second girl was described as standing at about five foot 10, and she had very, very short reddish brown hair, and was wearing a floral ankle length skirt as well as a white short sleeved shirt. The last girl was standing at about five foot eight. She had short, dirty blonde hair, an earring in her right ear, as well as a nose ring. Now, unfortunately, there was no security camera footage at this 7-Eleven. Now, that to me is mind blowing because it's a 7-Eleven. Those types of places always have security cameras. So, of course, of course, this 7-Eleven did not have security cameras working. And because of that, authorities were not able to figure out how this interaction started. They weren't able to figure out if these girls seeked out Brienne and were like off in a corner making up a plan and then went to go talk to her. They weren't able to figure out if it was just like a random bump in. They weren't able to see Brienne's body language when talking to these girls, whether it seemed like she knew them or didn't know them. There were so many questions because there was no security camera footage. Now, like I said, to this day, these three girls have never come forward to identify themselves and they have never been identified by anyone else in the area either. Now, five days after Brianne's disappearance on September 10th, 1998, Brianne's car was discovered. Brianne's black Acura Integra that had gold rims was found in a large ditch off of Echo Lake Road, which to give you some context is about a 27 to 30 minute drive from Revelstoke when I looked it up on a map. When the car was found, it had minor damages because it seemed to be that the car had hit a tree nearby. Now inside of the car was Brianne's wallet, her driver's license, as well as $200 in cash. Outside of the car on the ground were a pack of cigars as well as a can of Budweiser and an empty air freshener package. Now inside of the car were a yellow and red air freshener hanging on the rear view mirror as well as a beach towel, a pack of cigarettes, and a six pack of wine coolers. The only thing not found in Brienne's car was Brienne. And when authorities tried to see if they could get any DNA from the car, they were unable to because at least the outside of the car had been sitting in this ditch and had been collecting dust over the five days that it had been sitting there. And when it came to the inside of the car, the authorities said that the texture of the seats made it unable for them to retrieve any possible DNA or fingerprints. I'm not sure if it was like felt seats or leather seats or what the deal was. I wasn't able to find that anywhere no one said what the interior of the car was made out of but that is what the authority said is that they couldn't get any dna because of the texture from the inside of the car now something that you will notice along the way that we will kind of talk about in a little bit once we get towards the end of the case is that the authorities in this case have really not at least have not disclosed to the public any more information since the day that Brienne went missing. We basically know the exact same facts from the day Brienne went missing to now, which is over about 20 years later. So they still, to this day, have never been able to get any DNA from Brienne's car, even with new technology that has come out. Now, I do wanna mention something that is a little unclear in this case, and that is the potential of there being a partial footprint outside of Brienne's car. According to authorities, there was a partial footprint print of a size 11 male's boot in the dirt right outside of Brienne's vehicle. Now, authorities said that because it was partial, they weren't able to get a cast of it, which in essence means that they weren't able to get enough of it in order to try and figure out who it could have belonged to. There wasn't enough of it there to figure that out. But my question is, is that if they weren't able to figure it out, how did they know it was a size 11 and a half, you know? Also, how are they able to figure out that it was a boot? It's just, it seems like they're saying it was so partial that there was barely anything there. However, how can it be so partial when you have the size, the type of shoe it was, and who it could have possibly belonged to? It just seems a little strange. Now, after Brienne's car was discovered, there was a witness that came forward to authorities and said that on the early morning hours of September 6th, he saw a young woman matching Brienne's description walking up Echo Lake 
road. He said that this young woman was by herself and when she was walking, he said hi to her. However, she did not respond to him and she just continued to keep walking, which that to me brings up two possible questions and you guys can let me know yours. Let's say that was Brienne and her car got hit and the other three girls left and Brienne was walking by herself. You would think that Brienne is walking towards civilization or a town of some sort to be able to get help. And if she saw this man who said hi to her, why wouldn't she ask for help from him? Now it could be because he was a man and she was afraid and intimidated and didn't want to take that chance. So she kept walking and in turn landed in the hands of someone way worse. But it does make you wonder why she would be walking and not saying anything. Maybe she knew exactly where she was going. I know personally for me, I know places 30 minutes away from me that I know like the back of my hand. So it'd be interesting to know if Echo Lake Park was somewhere that she went quite often because if that's the case, maybe she was just like, I don't want to deal with it. I'm going to keep walking straight towards X, Y, and Z because I know there I can find a telephone, I can call someone, and I just don't want to deal with that. That to me is also a possibility. Now, when it came to the search for Brienne, it was really all hands on deck. You had hundreds of people looking through forests, through the woods and rivers and bodies of water, and you had helicopters and airplanes searching. However, no one could find Brienne anywhere. Now, something that I also want to mention is that during the weekend that Brienne went missing, not only was it Labor Day weekend, but it was also a very specific weekend in Revelstoke. This particular weekend was the CP ball tournament that was held in Revelstoke. Now, what is the CP ball tournament, you may be asking? Well, the CP ball tournament stands for the Canadian Pacific Slow Pitch Softball Tournament. So because of this new tournament, it brought so many new people into Revelstoke, which could be exactly why no one was able to identify these three young women, which is because no one had seen them before because they're not from there. So like I said in the beginning, there are a lot of questions when it comes to Brianne's case. Definitely more questions than answers. First off, why would Brienne leave with three young girls that she did not know? Brienne already had plans to go pick up Christy that night. She was supposed to pick up Christy within 15 minutes of being seen with these girls. So why would she ditch those plans? Which to me makes me believe she wasn't ditching those plans. And let me explain. Because there were wine coolers found in the car, which is what Christy said she told Brienne to go pick up, it makes me believe that Brienne was going to pick Pick up Christy that night and invited these three girls along with her to go with them throughout the parties that they were planning on going to that night. And there were witnesses who said that they saw Brienne in her car with three other passengers, which are obviously believed to be the three girls that she was seen talking to. Now, my question here is why would Brienne end up at Echo Lake Park if she was driving. There's two options that I think are possible in this case. And one is if the girl put a gun to Brienne's head and told her to drive, or two, if Brienne was not the one driving, and let's say one of the girls offered to be the designated driver for the night, and the other girls were just drinking in the back, and the plan was to take them to Echo Lake Park. There's a lot of different ways that that interaction could have gone down, if you think about it. Now, the other question that that comes from these three girls is what was possibly the motive? Why would these girls want to hurt Brienne if that's the theory that we're going with? And to me, a big thing that I think of in this case is the possibility of sex trafficking. Brienne has never been found to this day. And I think that it's a very good possibility that that could be due to the fact that she was sex trafficked. I could see this going down in multiple ways. I could see the girls being told to go recruit someone and they found Brienne. It was just wrong place, wrong time. And they were able to trap her into believing them because they're three girls. They get her in the car, they drive her to Echo Lake Park and that is where they meet the ringleader of this sex trafficking ring and that is where Brienne is transferred over to. But then again, the questions keep on going because there were no other car tracks found around the area. There were no other footprints found around the area other than the one size 11 boot 
print found right outside of Brianne's car. We have to knock out the motive of robbery here because the motive clearly was not that. Brianne's car was not stolen, her wallet was found in her car, $200 cash was found in her car. So if this was a robbery, those are all things that you would be taking, but every single one of those items was left inside of the car. Another big question is let's say these girls were staying for the weekend in Revelstoke. Where were they staying? Let's say they were staying for the tournament and they were staying at either a hotel. It should be easy to figure out who these girls are if they were staying at a hotel. They should have some sort of record of them in this hotel. The second question is maybe they weren't staying in a hotel, maybe they were camping. That way there would be no record of them. But to me personally, I find it very hard to believe that these three girls, that they would all of a sudden turn into these killers and take Brienne and murder her on their own. It just doesn't seem very likely to me because there's no point in that. Like, why, why are you doing that? Now, another big question in this case is what happened to Brienne on the night of September 4th that made her so upset going into work the next day? I think whoever was with her that night, someone had to have known on September 4th what was making Brienne so upset. And I think that that could possibly be a key factor in this because it could show who she was upset with, whether that was a guy or a girl. And it also could help explain her mindset on the night of September 5th. If she was just kind of like, I'm over this. I don't want to think about any drama. I don't want to deal with it. I'm just going to go off with these girls. It seems like a good time and kind of not really think straight in that sense, if that makes sense. And it's possible that there's some sort of connection. There could be a connection between what happened to her on the 4th and what happened to her on the 5th. Now, like I said earlier, this investigation has been kept extremely under wraps and no one's really talking about why this investigation has been so tight-lipped. Is there something that's being covered up and that's why there's so little information out there? We know the exact same amount that we did 20 years ago, over 20 years ago at this point. And why is that? Because there is evidence. You have her car. So it just doesn't make a lot of sense as to why they haven't been able to retain any other information information that could help lead to Brienne's return. Now, even though it has been over two decades and there hasn't been a lot of new information released to the public, Brienne's family is not giving up hope that Brienne will return. Every year on Brienne's birthday, Brienne's mother, Cheryl, lights a candle and puts it out on her front porch in hopes that it'll help guide Brienne back home. Cheryl also keeps the photo from Brienne's senior prom as the background photo of her iPhone because she says it's her favorite picture of Brienne. Cheryl's said, quote, it's almost like an alien came down and took her away in reference to Brienne's disappearance because it literally is like she disappeared out of thin air and has never been seen again. There currently is an Angel of Hope statue sitting in Woodenhead Park to honor Brienne. And what's interesting is that this statue actually had to have a metal cage put around it because vandalizers came and broke off the angel wings and caused damage on three separate occasions, which to me, I find very odd and almost personal. It seems like a personal vendetta. Why on three different occasions would vandalizers come and break off the statue to honor Brienne's life? I think it'd be very interesting to figure out who these vandalizers are and if there is any connection because it does seem a little strange. However, no one's been able to figure out who's vandalizing this statue. So that is Brienne's case, you guys. I know that there isn't a lot of information. I know it's way more questions than answers and I know it's really frustrating, but I think that that's part of the reason that this case is so important and why it's important to share cases like this. That way we can continue to spread the word and to spread awareness in hopes that there will be more information and hopefully a safe return. So let me know in the comments below what your theories are. And with that being said, you guys, that is all from me today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another true crime episode. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah. I make videos a couple times a week. It kind of varies, but you should subscribe and join the family. I love you guys so much and I'll be back in a couple days with a brand new one. Bye guys.